So for those of you who don't know me, I think there's maybe a couple of people who I don't know in the room. My name's Carissa. I have been here at City Church for about five and a half years, and I still love it just as much as when I started. Um, and uh, where's Isabel gone? Um, I've lost you. Um, oh, there you are. Um, so I left Coventry when I graduated back in 2008, and I was back six years later in 2014 and haven't left since. So who knows if we do pray hard enough? <laughs> um, so today I am preaching on 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22 but we won't be getting there for a while. (laughs) So instead, we're going to zoom out and we're going to look at the big picture of the whole letter. We've been at this for 17 weeks now and we've got seven more weeks to go. So I thought it would be useful to zoom out and see the bigger picture, try and connect some of the dots of the wonderful sermons that we've listened to. And also because the process by which I've come to the points I want to say about 1 Peter 3 verses 18 to 22 required me to look at the big picture of the letter often again and again and again because I'll be honest I struggled initially to work out what on earth Peter was trying to say at that stage of the letter and I think once you see the big picture it makes a lot more sense. So I want us to think about Peter's big question and how he answers it and my sense, having read the letter many times now, is that the question that he is trying to answer is, how do we live in a potentially hostile world? How do we live in a potentially hostile world? And a number of the letters in the New Testament deal with multiple issues in one letter. Peter doesn't do that. From word one to the final word, he's answering the same question. He, this is, this is very much a whole. And I think many of us may have noticed that there's this feeling of, of almost repetition in the things that we're hearing week on week. But that's because we're chunking up one message, essentially. It's, it's one idea, one thought, and we're looking at it in, in little mini chunks. So let's think about how he answers the question of how we, how do we live in a potentially hostile world. So first of all, I wanted to to think a little bit about what influences his answer to the question. So clearly, like all authors of scripture and the prophets he talks about in chapter one, he has listened to and inquired of the spirit of Christ in him. This is a co-authored letter. This is a letter from God to us. It's also a letter from Peter to us. And What he does, um, I think, is very similar to what God does in Jeremiah. Um, Let me just flick to that. So in Jeremiah 29, oh, I am shaking, I can feel it. Earlier, I thought, is it because I've got low blood sugar? I ate my breakfast at about half five because I woke up quite early this morning. I went and snuck and stole a biscuit. Um, It's it's good biscuit selection today. Um, So (laughs) um, I think what what Peter and what God is doing here um, in 1 Peter is very similar to what God does in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, where uh, Jeremiah sends a letter from God to the people in exile. And... um, You'll notice in verse 1 of 1 Peter that Peter describes us as elect exiles. So I think there's, there's, there's some parallels there. And I'm not going to go into detail, but I really recommend that you, you read that letter in Jeremiah 29. There's all sorts of interesting parallels. Um, yeah, God's focus on, on things like ordinary everyday life. I think there's a parallel there. Um, And also the fact that we, in fact, let's read that wonderful verse. Uh, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I think that's the heart of both of those letters. Uh, He also, Peter also draws on Jesus' teaching. There are lots of parallels with sections in the Sermon of the Mount. You may have noticed that a number of our preachers have quoted from the Sermon on the Mount, particularly uh, the Beatitudes, but also elsewhere. Uh, He also draws on scripture. So he directly quotes the Old Testament. We get Leviticus, Isaiah, 
the Psalms, and we also get stories from the Old Testament. Uh, we see Noah and Sarah and so on. So he's very much going to the scriptures in order to answer the question of how do we live in this potentially hostile world. And then also he draws on his own experiences of seeing firsthand Jesus' own suffering and no doubt his own experiences too, which we get to see a little of in Acts. So how does he begin? He begins with this idea of exile Um, Exile usually means that we're not in the culture of our birth or the culture that we see as home. And essentially the culture around us is not our natural habitat. There are different values to those that we're used to. Um, Allegiances are different. And, And for us, why is this culture not our home? Well, it's because we've been born again. We have a different country of birth. And it's not this present age. We're looking forward to a new heavens, a new earth, that that will be our homeland. It's also no longer our home because we have been called out of darkness into light. Peter tells us that. And he also tells us that we've been ransomed from the futile way of life that characterises the world around us. So, we are not the same kind of human. We've been born again. We're spiritually alive. And we are people of light in a dark world. And we are people who who do live an entirely different life. Even when we're doing something as simple as being a husband or a wife or an employee, we are fundamentally living an entirely different way of life. Um, So we are exiles, but we are also exiles on purpose. Uh, God describes us as elect exiles, and in verse 2, he says that um, the people he is writing to, um, they're exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. I've lost my place. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so there is a reason why we are here. God could take us out of this world as soon as we believe, but he doesn't. Uh, We are here on purpose, we're on a mission. Paul tells us we're ambassadors, we're ambassadors from God to this world that is not our home. So that should shape the way that we answer the question, how do we live in a potentially hostile world? And it certainly shapes the way uh, Peter thinks about it. He also gives us lenses of hope. So when things are hard, our perspective can often distort and we no longer see clearly. So I don't know about you, but even a change in the weather can change how hopeful or not hopeful I feel. Um, And when things go wrong, we can swap the lenses of hope for the lenses of realism. What can I realistically expect in this situation? Or pessimism or discouragement. But Peter wants us to see through the lenses of hope because the lenses of hope are the lenses of truth. And so they help us navigate our way through this world. Realism or pessimism or discouragement lie to us about what we should expect and how to interpret what's happening to us. So Peter gives us lenses to put into our metaphorical glasses. um, And he does this in a number of ways. I don't have time to talk about all of them. But I want to mention two, which he, he, he does a lot. So the first is that he, he um, really focuses on our identity and status. And the second is the future we're looking towards. So thinking about our identity and status. When we live in a potentially hostile world, we might be tempted to think that we are losing, that we're without power, that we're defeated, that we need to be on the defensive that we need to fight our corner. But that's just not true. The truth is, we have a settled and certain status of honour and privilege. So I'm just going to read you some of the things that Peter says is true of us. And many of these we've, we've looked at in much more detail in previous sessions, but it's good to be reminded. So as we've just heard, we are, we are born again. 
And because of that, we're heirs. We're heirs of God. We are also um, believers in God. That is our identity. We are those who trust in him. We are a holy and a royal priesthood. We stand between the God that we know so intimately and this world that doesn't know him. We are the bridge. We're a chosen race, a holy nation. As people in exile, we might feel like we don't have a country, we don't have a nation, but no, we're a holy nation, we're just on mission. We're a people for God's own possession. We are God's people. And we are people who are free in a world that is enslaved. And we are the household of God, the family, the children of God himself. So, we are holy, we are royal, we are chosen, we are free, and we are loved. I mean, there's just so much honour and privilege in all of that. And that's just a taster. I mean, if we, if we expanded to look at all of scripture um, and also into the rest of the letter, I've, I've, um, I don't know if I've done the whole letter, but anyway, there is more, there's more to say. When we know who we are, we are empowered to live in this world in an undefeated way, full of hope, full of expectation, not crushed by pessimism, not crushed by discouragement, not reduced by realism. So that's one of our lenses of hope, our identity and our status. So then also our future. So this world is not all there is. And I think we've, we've had that coming through today. Um, right near the start of the letter, Peter focuses on this inheritance that we're due to receive. And I think there's a reason he does that right at the start. It really helps for us to remember that. Um, and it's not just an inheritance, but it's one that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, guarded by God's power, as we heard in that session. It is absolutely certain. So when our world feels shaky and uncertain, our future remains certain. Um, Paul calls it a glorious inheritance. Uh, it's an inheritance, um, the Bible tells us, of God's good promises. Heard that again this morning an inheritance of salvation, of the kingdom of God itself, of eternal life, and of glory. Before this, previously, the only inheritance we had was the inheritance that all humans inherit from Adam. Not a great one. Um, an inheritance of death and judgment, and as Peter tells us, uh, a futile way of life. But our life here, lived for God, lived with God, is never futile. It always leads to life. Peter also points again and again, I love the repetition of this, to the day that Jesus and his glory are revealed. So it's quite, it's quite fun just to go through and find every time that he uses revealed, revelation, appearing, it comes up many, many times. So the reality is that God is present in this world. And Jesus is this world's ruler. That is true. But for the moment, that's hidden from many people. But it will be revealed. He will return in glory. This situation where people think that there is no God or that God can be ignored, it's only temporary. So that's our two of our lenses of hope, our identity and status and our future. So on this kind of canvas, on this backdrop, Peter builds his answer to the question, how do we live in a potentially hostile world or how do we live in the world of exile? Now, <laughs> when I was trying to put this together, for a long time, I just couldn't see how his answer was sort of constructed. I just saw kind of him circling around. And so what I did is I, I went through and I highlighted every time he tells us to do something. Because that seems like that would be part of his answer of how do we, how do we live in this world? We've got to live in some, some action. And it suddenly all became clear. So <laughs> I'm going to 
walk you through what I think I've seen and wonderfully not I don't know if, if this was intentional on the work of Peter probably not there are seven steps <laughs> so the first is that we get our thinking right so back in um, chapter 1 verse 13 he says prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ and I think that's why Peter models this throughout the whole book is he's 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 just giving us a picture of reality he's getting our thinking right so we start here and then next he tells us to get our desires and our hearts in order so for example the following verse says do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance um, be holy I'm just going to read through these they don't all come immediately after each other but be holy fear God love one another put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn children long for the pure spiritual milk I long for the Lord and abstain from the passions of the flesh so it's about putting off things that, uh, that shouldn't be a part of us it's about um, making priority the things that should be priority seeking after the Lord and fearing him so we get our thinking right, we get our, our hearts, our desires right, um, and then he tells us to do good. And I think we've seen that throughout many of these sessions, that there's an emphasis on doing good. But it comes from a place of knowing who we are, and um, yeah, it's, it's not a striving kind of a doing good. And what I love is that the doing good boils down to be a good citizen, be a good brother or sister in Christ, be a good employee, be a good husband, be a good wife. Um, and I think this is a nice little summary in chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable. It's so wonderfully low-key. <laughs> it's what we're doing every day, but done in service of God. It's, it's not flashy. It's, it's quite humble. But that is what it means to live a, a life in service to God. Okay, so we've got our thinking right, we've got our desires right, we're, we're now living out our relationships with other people in a way that's influenced by that. Um, and then he tells us not to give up doing good if we suffer for it. Um, so, for example, our, um, the, sec se the section on a being a servant, he says, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And the reason that we don't give up doing good if we suffer for it is because we are on a mission. We're here to serve God. So um, we could stop there. You think, okay, well done, Peter. You've, you've told us to kind of get our heads and hearts right and do some good and keep at it and not give up. Sounds great. Um, but he, he, he takes us further. So he then says, also do not retaliate. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. I think we really do hear the Sermon of the Mount here and the Beatitudes and other parts of Jesus' teaching. Um, and, and just Jesus' own example, is he, he makes that connection. So it's not just that we don't give up doing good, but we also have an attitude where we don't retaliate. But even more than that, Peter says that we should not just... Uh, uh, prevent ourselves from retaliating we should intentionally bless those who are causing us to suffer um, and he points to our calling here and our expectation that we will receive a blessing for doing blessing to those who, who are hostile to us and then finally we kind of get to the ta-da uh, which is the okay so now be ready to give an answer to the people who say so why are you blessing that person who's awful to you? Why are you persisting to do good when it costs you so much? Like, what? Are you mad? Um, then, yeah, we're prepared to give an answer. And that is actually us having the, the perfect opportunity to be that ambassador. So to, to live out that very purpose for why we are exiles on purpose. And so that's his kind of seven steps. And it leads us up to the passage that I've been given to preach. But before I move on to that, 
He also, as he goes through each of these commands, he also has a number of so that statements. Do all of this so that. So I'm just going to read you those. So do all of this so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus. So that you may grow up into salvation. That people may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. To put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So that those who revile your good behaviour in Christ may be put to shame. This one's just for wives. And if some husbands do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So that your prayers may not be hindered. And so that you may obtain a blessing. So, we've had that sweep through his his letter and we arrive at chapter 3, verse 18. And it is, so I've got chapter 18, no, chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. He makes no commands in this section. It's entirely without commands. It's essentially a block of theology, which is why I wasn't quite sure what to do with it initially. I couldn't quite see why Peter was saying it. And I'm just going to quote three, uh, three commentaries that I read. I read a lot of commentaries. <laughs> Doctrinally and linguistically, this is the most difficult and debated passage in the letter. This section contains some of the most difficult exegetical problems in the New Testament... And verses 19 and 20 constitute one of the most puzzling and intriguing texts in the New Testament. So I set myself a challenge by volunteering to do this one. (laughs) (laughs) To be fair, Matthew um, did check in with me and said, you know, you do know this is a hard one, don't you? Um, (laughs) So as we've seen, Peter starts with the need to get our thinking right. And throughout, he's giving us these lenses of hope. And I think that's what he's doing here in this particular passage, that he is giving us um, more of these lenses of hope. But in particular, um, I think that he's trying to do it in the stickiest way possible. Um, I don't know if any of you know this, but one of the things that people who write nonfiction often try and do is produce a sticky message. So an, basically an idea or a message that's going to stick in your head because then, A, you know, you're more likely to make use of it, but also you're more likely to talk to your friends about, oh, I read a book and it was about this. So often they're looking for how to make things sticky. And one of the recommendations is to use story. Stories stick. And I think because we are so quick to take off the lenses of hope, Peter wants to use story to make sure that they stay on when things get tough. And yeah, this is a strategy, obviously, we see throughout the Bible. I think there's a a reason why God wrote an awful lot of it as stories and Jesus uses parables. So if I was to have given this sermon at about... hmm, 10 o'clock last night, what was coming next would be entirely different. But as I went to bed, God spoke to me, so this next bit is less well put together, I'll be honest. Um, So, I had about four or five points I wanted to make, but I think God wanted me to narrow in on just one, possibly two. I'm going to start with one and see how I feel. So, The point is that suffering is not the end of the story. So I write creatively for fun, many of you know. And a little while ago, I did a whole load of research on story structure, how to construct stories. And there are all sorts of different models that people use, or obviously they come up with their own. But there is a a structure commonly used in film writing uh, called Save the Cat, if you've ever come across it. And it's very formulaic and it's used by lots of Hollywood writers. So once you know the framework, it ruins lots of Hollywood films for you. But here we go. Um, About 75% into the script, you get the all is lost moment. So everything has gone wrong. And the next stage 
is called the Dark Knight of the Soul. So the character finds out that everything's gone wrong, and then they enter this kind of moment of despair. And so you're meant to, as the audience, think, oh, what's going to happen? But we've all seen too many of these movies to know that it's all going to be fine. Um, but the character doesn't know that. The character believes this is the end of the story, that it has all gone wrong. There is no hope. This is the end. The character doesn't know what the writer, and most of us as the audience, know that there is a happy ending coming just down the road. And we are in the privileged situation that we are characters in a, in a story, as it were, but we know the ending. There should never be a point where we feel like we're at the all is lost moment or we've entered that dark night of the soul because there's just no, there's no need. So Jesus is our ultimate example of this type of story. He is the ultimate example of someone who suffers unjustly, but for which God has a much bigger story. And he knew it. So in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So I'm going to read our passage now. And hopefully with, with all of that in mind, you won't get distracted by the strange stuff about Noah, the, the bits about baptism, nobody knows what they mean. We'll focus on the bits about Jesus. Okay. <laughs> for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So I guess I probably should address some of the weird stuff in the middle. Uh, <laughs> so the bit where we've got Jesus going to um, proclaim to the spirits in prison, genuinely there is not consensus on what this means. Um, and as those commentators have said, it's a bit puzzling. Um, but there are some options. So maybe Jesus is proclaiming his victory to the fallen angels of Genesis 6, uh, verses 1 to 4. Maybe he's proclaiming his victory to the spirits of people who died prior to the flood, perhaps offering them a chance to respond to the gospel. Feels a bit, maybe that doesn't fit with the rest of the New Testament. Um, that this is a looking back to Noah's time, and Jesus was sort of in Noah spiritually and preached the people through Noah. No one really quite knows. But I think in terms of looking at where this is positioned in the flow of this text, I think it's there to try and show us that Jesus was victorious in his suffering and death. I think this is a victorious proclaiming of good news and victory. I did not stay dead, guys. <laughs> I have won. It was not the end of the story. And if it is to spirits, you thought you'd won but you have not. Whatever Satan was trying to achieve, he hasn't achieved it. And a tiny drop of it. So Jesus, he went through that suffering for purpose. And I think if we go back to verse 17, uh, for it is better to suffer for good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. We can be sure that this really was God's will. It was foreknown, it was predicted, it was something that Jesus himself told Peter off for, for when, he, when Jesus was saying, I'm going to have to go and suffer on the cross and then rise again. And Peter goes, no. And Jesus has to pull him aside and say, mm -mm -mm, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> so there is a sense in which this is very much the will of God. And the purpose, wonderfully, is for our salvation and to bring us to God and when we suffer for doing good 
It's part of our mission that connects with Jesus' mission. So I imagine that um, when Peter was suffering for doing good, and he did, for example, when he and John were um, going to the temple and the lame beggar was healed, the response of the authorities was to throw them in prison. So he certainly knew what it was to suffer for doing good. I imagine that what he did is he thought about Jesus. He thought about the saviour who had gone ahead of him into suffering and had come out the other side. And where is Jesus now? He is in heaven at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. This is where my notes get a bit hazy. So, I think, yeah, what I want to, to do is probably stop there. I had another point, but I think I, think I want to keep it simple. Uh, the point that I want to make is that suffering is not the end of the story. That was true for Jesus, and it is also true for us. The end.